Thank you, Hanko. Thank you, everyone. Um, let me first uh, let you know how I became, um, or I was first introduced to Maria de Molina. I, uh, my mentor, uh, Dr. Joseph O'Callaghan, had suggested that I do uh, my dissertation on Fernando IV and church-state relations. Uh, Fernando IV is her son. So when I began my uh, dissertation in looking at church-state relations in late 13th, early 14th century Castile, um, Maria continually came up in the conversation that I was having with the Chronicles and with all the other primary resources and the secondary resources. Um, and I found her fascinating, but that's not who I was supposed to be uh, working on. I was supposed to be working on her son and his relationship with the, with the various uh, bishops. But she always was there, and I always wanted to do more with her. And as time went on, I noticed that no one else um, in the field of Spanish Middle East history here in the United States, nor in Spain, um, or anywhere else, was doing any work on her at all. And she appeared every once in a while in an article, uh, mentioned dealing with some other uh, Castilian queen or Aragonese queen, but nothing really much on her until 2005. And a biography appeared by a young professor at um, the University of Seville, who I met this past spring. I spent some time with her, Maria Antonio uh, Carmona Ruiz. And um, we spent some time talking about why she uh, was interested in this. And I really didn't get a really good answer. I came to the conclusion her mentor is a very uh, famous historian. And he had probably suggested her doing this, I think, for looking at her tenure or something. So, but we had a good conversation. But I realized that she still needed, that I realized that I was right. Nobody was working on her. So when this biography is finished, it will be the only biography in English dealing with this queen. And why did I think she was so important is what my talk is about today. I called her a queen of indomitable spirit. And she certainly is. She is the most determined woman in particular in making sure that she can get her marriage legitimized, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, also keeping her son on the throne and her young grandson. So she was a queen for nine years, then she was a regent under her son, and then a regent for her grandson. So she lived to her early 60s as such at a time. So to give you a little background information about the world in which she lived, um, historians have uh, loved to use maps, and I had to use a map of uh, 13th century um, Iberian Peninsula. Um, to give you an idea, th this is what it looked like from about 1212 to 1492. There were three basic kingdoms here. She comes from the northern region up here, right where Baladolid is. Um, but in 1212, most of this, there was a famous battle that was fought down in the center area called Las Novas de Tolosa. But it was her uncle, actually, who was responsible for con conquering both Cordoba, which is here, and Seville, which is down here, in 1236 and 1248, respectively, leaving the peninsula to pretty much look like this until 1492. For most of the time, she, she was born in 1259 and died in 1321. For most of that period, the battles that were fought were fought on the frontier by where the Kingdom of Granada. That was the last of the Muslim kingdoms. So that's where she is places in history in that latter part of the 13th and the early 14th century. This is a drawing that I found on the internet. Um, nobody really knows what she looked, looked like. Um, and I have her seal that I'll show you in a few minutes um, that I found at the Municipal Archives in Seville. But unfortunately, the face was kind of squished. So you couldn't really see what she might have looked like. And the other um, edifice that I found is at her tomb, um, which is in Baladolid. And that, too, um, was, was sculpted in the 17th no, 16th century, um, and I 
really don't know where the person decided that's what she looked like. So there really is <laughs> no evidence exactly what she looked like. Um, her f original biographer in the 1930s, Mercias Ballesteros, um, indicated that she was very beautiful and went on to say how much that her husband, the future king Sancho IV, fell in love with her because of her beauty. I don't know if that's true or not. And she gives us no footnote to tell me where she decided that information came from. I found nothing in the Chronicles or any of the other primary sources that indicate that she was this strikingly gorgeous woman that Ballesteros tells us. As I said, she was born in 1259. She was born in northern Spain. And I traveled there this um, past February in the, in the middle of winter, and it was very, very cold uh, this year in Spain. And as I was traveling from Madrid northwest to Valladolid, you could see how desolate the countryside was. It was very, very barren, and that's where she came from. Um, I went there mainly to see her tomb, which I said was in Valladolid. Um, she um, was the daughter of Alfonso de Molina. He was the brother of Fernando III, who would, was the king who conquered Cordoba and Sevilla. So um, she is part of the royal family, but not the immediate <coughs> royal family. And she grew up in northern Castile, principally at a Cistercian monastery, which is now in ruins outside of uh, Valladolid. Um, but at some time, she must have come in contact with the immediate <coughs> royal family because her husband um, is part of that. He's Sancho IV, and he is the son, he is Fernando III's grandson. Um, but she herself was not part of that royal family. But as far as I can tell, and the two biographies were written, the one that was written in 2005, the one in the 1930s, indicates that she was well educated. There's no evidence to prove that, but she was such a remarkable woman in, um, in being queen and in regent twice that she must have had a good education. Um, she has tremendous political acumen. She um, just is an amazing person. person. And if you read through the, um, the laws, especially the Siete Partidas, the, uh, the you find that in that it says that all royal children, including young girls, are to be educated. So I assumed that she was fairly well educated. I saw some of her correspondence that was at the monastery that they had saved. So I'm pretty sure she was such a remarkable person in handling political situations and being able to compromise and deals with kings and bishops and other nobles that I think she was pretty well educated for sure. Um, so talking about her husband, I found this contemporary uh, manuscript on the internet and this is Sancho, um, probably more than likely um, knighting his son, his eldest son, Fernando, who becomes Fernando IV. Uh, one of seven children, they were uh, married for nine years, <coughs> I should say 11 years, and during that 11 years, they had seven children, five of which survive. This is their, uh, probably their son, Fernando IV. Sancho um, is a very interesting character in himself. Um, the second son of Alfonso X, and he will eventually become king, um, mainly because his eldest brother died, unfortunately, in, in 1275. Um, as he was about to be involved in a war with the Muslims in southern Spain. Um, and he, the eldest brother, left two sons, the eldest being Alfonso de la Serda. And Sancho, immediately when the, his brother died in 1275, immediately went uh, ahead and led the charge against the Muslims, and he acquired uh, the title of Sancho el Bravo, this great hero. Um, and the following year, which is in 1276, his father, uh, Alfonso X, came down and declared that he would be the heir, the new heir. But the problem was there were these two grandsons of the eldest son who also had the support of 
the French king, because their mother happened to be a French princess, and also of the Aragonese king. So that presents a conflict. Within a couple of years, the father decides, Alfonso X, that he's not going to make Sancho the heir, and that leads us to this slide. Um, I found this, this is really interesting. That's Alfonso X, who was a remarkable king, um, both a uh, scholar and a poet. Um, he is supposedly have written these series of songs and um, poems about the Virgin Mary, uh, dedicated to the Virgin Mary, which is called the Contigas. Um, he is responsible for uh, putting together the laws that I just mentioned called the Siete Partidas, which were based on trying to accumulate all of customary law um, and putting it together into one final law for Castile. But he also had a fantasy, and his fantasy was to be the Holy Roman Emperor. And he set out in 1257 to become the Holy Roman Emperor. And he spent a lot of time and a lot of Castilian money bribing the electors to become <laughs> the Holy Roman Emperor. And he tended to heavily tax his people, which led to a problem, plus the problem that he lost his heir in 1275. So by the time we come to the fact that by 1282, Sancho has had enough of his father's fantasies in trying to become the Holy Roman Emperor and has a lot of other people in Castile. So for two years, from 1282 to 1284, we have a rebellion, a civil war, in trying to succeed to the throne. He wants to be the heir, and um, Alfonso has decided that his grandson, Alfonso de la Cerda, is going to be the heir. And so that's the point in which we meet Maria. Um, at some point, they met. I don't know how, when, I'm assuming that she came to court. Um, uh, Valladolid at the time is not an important city today, it's more of a commercial city today. It doesn't have a great, his, uh, many his, historical uh, artifacts left in the city. But at some point they met, whether as Ballesteros tells us they fell madly in love, I'm not too sure if that's true. Um, I think, in all my research, I think he married her to despite his father, because he was already married, or technically, by the church considered it married. He had been betrothed when he was about 11 years old to a uh, young lady uh, who lived in northern, Ca uh, northern Aragon, southern Spain. Her name was Guillermo de Macada, and according to the church, they were legally married. She had never, the marriage had never been consummated. Um, they had never met, but the church considered their marriage legal. So um, I think to despite his, despite his father, because his father would never say that he was the heir officially, he married Maria. They were both in their early 20s, which was kind of late at that period of time to marry. And she was never betrothed. I have no evidence that her father ever set up any kind of marriage with her at all. So they married in July 1282 in Toledo at the cathedral. And that changes Maria's life because now she becomes front, front and center of this stage. It is from that point that we have a major problem. They married without a papal dispensation. They were, Maria was her husband's second cousin. They had, um, mutual ancestors. So they, that was one of the problems. So they violated the law, the ecclesiastical laws of consanguinity. Also the ecclesiastical law of affinity, which means because she was actually the godmother to one of Sancho's illegitimate daughters. The other reason was he was still, ma he was technically married to this other <laughs> woman. So all of those factors, would not allow them to get a dispensation. So uh, Alfonso X died in 1284, and Sancho became king without ha being the legitimate heir, first of all, nor having this papal dispensation. Uh, the f and the, the pope, his name was Martin IV, was more in favor of the French monarchy, and that was where uh, the mother of the 
of Alfonso de la Seta was French. So he uh, refused to grant them the dispensation um, at that particular time. So his reasoning was there were too many impediments, right? He also, he excommunicated them both. And then he also sent them another letter saying that um, because you rebelled against your father, I'm also going to excommunicate you and place an interdict on the kingdom, meaning that no religious or no sacraments could be held in the kingdom. Um, that's how they started their, uh, not only their marriage, but also their, his kingship in 1284 under those circumstances. And also surrounding this are a cast of very um, unsavory characters, including Sancho's brother, uh, Juan, I should say brothers, Juan and Jaime, were both willing to um, take the throne at any cost. Then there was an elderly uncle who showed up. His name is Enrique. And then we have um, the bishops who were very disgruntled because they had been abused. We also have lots of other nobles. We have the Lara family and the Hara family. And we have the townsmen, all who feel that they have been mistreated and all who want some piece of this throne. That's how the marriage, the marriage begins and that's how the throne begins. During the nine years that he was king, Maria really, he was busy dealing with the nobles and, and doing, fighting some wars down in southern Spain and other things. She is the one that is constantly pressuring the papacy for this dispensation. Not just to invalidate her marriage, but any children from this. Because if her children aren't legitimate, then whoever takes the throne will have more civil wars. Um, Martin refuses. The next uh, pope is Honorius IV. And he, too, um, will not grant the dispensation, but he lifts the interdict over the rebellion. So that felt. Um, he was only pope for a few years. And then Nicholas IV becomes the pope. And that was the time, that's the latter part of his reign, in which both Maria and Sancho felt, wow, this is really going to be good. I know him. He knows me. Um, Sancho was a great supporter of the Franciscan order, and Nicholas was a Franciscan. And he was a, originally the papal legate in Castile, so they had met. So he felt, this is a good time. We'll now be able to get this dispensation. Well, Nicholas wouldn't give it to him either. He felt the impediments were too strong, and it really was um, something he went very so he could not grant it to this. Sancho died in 1295 on the 26th of A 25th of April, excuse me, um, without the dispensation being obtained at all. And his son is only nine years old, which comes to this picture. This is a painting um, that was done um, in the 19th century. It's in the Chamber of Deputies in Madrid, in the main hallway when you come in. Um, I was very surprised when I was there. I kind of looked. I went, wow. Uh, this is a 19th century artist's interpretation of what the event would have occurred. Um, he, as I said, he died on the, the, 20, the 25th of April in 1295. That is Sancho IV. There was nine days of mourning. And so um, the Chronicle tells us on the 4th of May that Maria pre presented Sancho, he's supposed to age nine, to at the cathedral in Toledo to the community that was there. Um, this is the Archbishop of Toledo, Gonzalos, and surrounding him are the various nobles. Um, the painting makes them look like they really supported this whole thing. If you read through the primary sources, they were not. They were as eager as can be to take the throne away from this young boy and his mother. She had been designated by Sancho as the, as the regent. She was be to the regent for her son until he uh, reached his majority, which would not be for several, several years. Um, but she immediately was faced with all those unscrupulous people. They come up. The two, um, her two brothers-in-law, Juan and Jaime, are also looking for the crown. She's got the old uncle, Enrique. He's still looking for the crown. She, in fact, she has to, at one point, she has to make him a co-regent to try to solidify this. Um, 
She finally decides that the best thing she can do is call a Cortez, or a parliament is really, and she does that in August of 1295, in which she asks all of the towns, the nobles and the bishops, to affirm their belief that he is the true king, which they do, and then immediately squabble amongst each other, to the point that the townsmen ask her, they will not give her any support or money unless she makes the nobles and the bishops leave the Cortes. So she decides at that point that they are her allies. And from 1295 to 1301, she works tirelessly to get this dispensation and also to fight a civil war. And she also has to contend with the monarchs in Aragon as well as the monarch, the king of France, um, who is much much very difficult. And it is through that that she learns a lot about compromising. She, and when you read through the Chronicles, you find out, uh, they mention several times this large sums of money that she was asking the Cortes for to pay the Pope. And we have a very famous Pope call, uh, who comes into that office in the year 1294. He's Boniface VIII. Um, and Boniface VIII will find himself um, in a major, major um, political crisis with the French king, uh, Philip IV. And I feel, because it suddenly out of nowhere, in 1301, Boniface grants her not the dispensation, but legitimizes the children. And yes, he got a lot of money, money he needed to fight this war he was fighting with Philip IV. And I think that's why she was finally, after 19 years, she was able to legitimize his rule. And it also helped to um, solidify his position and to stop the Civil War. He lives from 1301 until 1312. He died a very young age of 27 of tuberculosis. But through her efforts, uh, her determination to keep him on the throne, he stays on the throne. When he died, um, he left a son, a small son, um, who was just a year old, becomes Alfonso the 11th. And she again becomes regent for him. And um, from that point on, from 1312 until her death in 1321, she again has to fight with that old cast of characters. Um, except for Enrique, he had died, but she still had her brothers-in-law <laughs> and a few other nobles who would, who, would, uh, who would come up, and she's able to se secure the phone, throne for him so that he can govern, which he does. He will, he will certainly govern the set. So she's, this is what she was doing. When I was in Seville, uh, one of the, I w was doing research at the municipal archives, as I mentioned, and I was able to find her um, seal, um, which Jose was so kind to open up the file for me. For some reason, I couldn't open up the file when they sent it to me. But this is her actual seal, and they were very kind to let me not only um, receive this image of her, but they let me come in and actually s look at it, and I spent some time really <coughs> looking at it. It's about two and a half inches t tall, and maybe an inch, inch and a half wide, and I was able to be able to spend some time, so I actually saw it, so that she, this is her her seal. This is the monastery that I went to visit in Valladolid. Um, when this is what it looks like today. It's been refurbished, so it, it did not look like th this at all. It's a royal monastery. I wrote a letter to the abbess and asked her if I could come and visit. Did she have a time? And she told me to, she, we set up a date, and she told me to come um, later in the afternoon at 4.30. And I realized when I went there, there this is a school. It's attached to this is a, a, is a grammar school. And inside the palace, um, this is, is uh, the royal palace of Bangalena. This is the main gate. It's the only part of Maria's palace that survived. Um, her son, unfortunately, um, I should say her grandson, Alfonso XI, <coughs> Um, was warring against a faction in Valladolid um, in was about the 1230, uh, 1330s or so, and he had to destroy the palace. 
Um, and that's all that lives. And it's one of the finest examples of Mudehar architecture that um, we have left here. And this is mainly one of the few things that's left in um, Valladolid um, as such. So the, the Sister Maria, who took me around and spent, uh, spent a lot of time telling me all about Maria de Molina, because she was, she was so pleased to find somebody um, who knew who she was, first of all, and wanted to know more about her. So we spent about two hours together going through the whole complex and telling me about Maria. And this is her tomb. She is buried here. Um, and in the very front of it, um, this is, a, as I said, a Cistercian monastery, and their patron saint is uh, the Virgin Mary. And those are the two seals of the Kingdom of Castile Leon, and of course the Virgin Mary is there. But the other side of this is Maria actually donating. She is the one who donated um, her palace to these Cistercian nuns. Um, and this is a picture of her, um, the nuns receiving from Maria, uh, her charter in the year 1320, the year before she died. She was a great patron of, of many of the Cistercian monasteries in Castile and Leon. So that's my story about Maria de Molina. <laughs>